This. His Excellency Ambassador Owen Jenkins, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor Leste. Honorable Mr. Sugi Harjo, Head of Human Resources Development Agency on Transportation. Mr. Popik Montanasha, Secretary of Agency for Human Resources Development on Transportation. Secretary of Greater Jakarta Transportation Agency, Head of Human Resources Development Center on Sea Transportation, Head of Human Resources Development Center on Air Transportation, Official Ministry of Transportation of Indonesia, Delegation and Officials of British Embassy to Indonesia, Cadets, Participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, let us praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of His bless and mercy. We gather here with healthy condition for the general lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dimitri. It is precious chance for me to be your master of ceremony on this very special event of general lecture by His Excellency Ambassador Owen Jenkins with interesting topic titled United Kingdom Capability in Transportation. On this special morning, we have several agenda which consist of six parts. Opening, singing Indonesian national anthem, welcome remarks from Mr. Sugiharjo, our main agenda which is presentation from the speaker and will be guided by moderator, Mr. Ahmad Bahrawi. A discussion and conclusion and photo session. As the first ag agenda of today's event, let's stand together singing Indonesian national anthem. I would like to invite all the participants, ladies and gentlemen, to stand up. participant please kindly have a seat the next agenda is welcoming remarks that will be delivered by mr sugiharjo mr sugiharjo time is yours thank you his excellency mr owen jenkins british ambassador to indonesia and timor leste official of the ministry of transportation of indonesia 
officials of the British Embassy to Indonesia and Timor Leste, cadets, participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In this wonderful morning, let us praise to God Almighty for all His blessing that we have could gather here. It is a good honor for me to deliver this welcome speech on behalf of the Ministry of Transportation. I would like to take this opportunity to express my highest appreciation and gratitude to His Excellency Mr. Owen Jenkins for taking time to be our main speaker in this general lecture on the UK strengths and capability in transportation. This event is conducted virtually by Agency of the Human Resources Development on Transportation in collaboration with British Embassy, which aim to give insights to the cadets about the updated transportation system in UK as one of a developed country. His Excellency, guests, cadets, ladies and gentlemen, on last January, I met Mr. Owen in a courtesy call to Minister of Transportation in Indonesia, Bapak Budi Karya Sumadi. On that occasion, both Minister and Ambassador mentioned the importance to enhance I repeat, the, ex the importance to enhance capacity of human resources in all sectors, including transportation sector. Upon the request of the minister, I was assigned to further communicate with the UK delegations to follow up and seek the cooperation possibilities related to the human resources development. His Excellency, please allow me to introduce our agency to you and UK delegation. The Agency of Human Resources Development on Transportation is an institution under the Ministry of Transportation, which is responsible to develop the human resources on land transportation, railway, Sea transportation and civil efficiency. Our agency manages 26 education and training institutions, which are located around Indonesia with more than 16,000 cadets in total and, the, and graduated approximately, approximately 5,000 cadets per year. One of our strategy to enhance the value of our graduated in transportation industry is through enhancement, their quality and competencies. Fulfillment of the national and international standard also one of the most important thing that should be focused on. Cooperation and collaboration with our international partners could be the excellent option. I hope this general lecture could stimulate and encourage the management of our school under the ministry to become more active in exploring cooperation and opportunities in capacity building, which is in line with Indonesian mission as stated by President Jokowi, that development of human resources is one top of the national priority. His Excellency, guests, cadets, ladies and gentlemen, as we have known that United Kingdom has sophisticated transportation system, I myself last year were in London to attend IMO assembly meeting held on November 2019. I came by airplane, landed in London Heathrow, 
a major international airport in UK. While in London, I had a chance to try almost all transportation modes. I used private car, taxi, underground, double deck bus, Santander cycle, and river bus. I also visited transportation facilities in Farringdon Station. It was valuable experience for me to know how safe, reliable, accessible, and integrated transportation system in London. Therefore, Excellency, by this lecture, I hope you could share your success story regarding the transportation system that had been implemented as well as UK capabilities in terms of transportation development. And for all cadets, I hope you are able to gain the knowledge and expand your understanding on the transportation system in advanced country. Our event today would be a notable one since we have important and competent speakers. This is a good start for us to exchange our knowledge and experience regarding the current transportation condition in each country. I confident our moderator today, Mr. Bahrawi, Director of Polytechnic Civil Association in Makassar, could facilitate your curiosities. I wish you all have a productive lecture and fruitful discussion this morning. Once again, I thank you, His Excellency and UK delegation for making this event happen. I hope there always be synergic and mutually beneficial cooperation and collaboration between Indonesia and United Kingdom in the future. I thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Sugiharjo, for the speech. Our next agenda is general lecture, which will be delivered by His Excellency and will be guided by moderator Mr. Ahmad Bahrawi, the Director of Polytechnic of Civil Aviation Makassar. For Mr. Bahrawi, time is yours. His Excellency, Mr. Owen Jenkins, uh, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste, Honorable Mr. Sugi Harjo, uh, Head of Human Resources Development Agency on Transportation, Ministry of Transportation of the Indonesia, Secretary of uh, Greater uh, Jakarta Transportation Authority, Mr. Harry Sumar Sudarmaji, Mr. Sahatua, Distinguished Headmaster and Directors of Transportation Schools under Ministry of Transportation, lecturers, cadets, ladies, and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ahmad Bahrawi, currently appointed as Director of Aviation Polytechnics of Makassar. And it is an honor to me to attend this general lecture and serving as your moderator today. And we have a very, very great speaker with us, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Owen Jenkins, the British Ambassador, who will deliver the UK cap capabilities in transportation and will be accompanied by a delegation of the UK. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Okay, uh, before I hand it this uh, lecture to you, uh, please allow me to read your resumes. Okay. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Owen Jenkins is the British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste. He took up his post in July 2019. Before his appointment as Ambassador, uh, his Excellency was the British Prime Minister's special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, responsible for engaging at the highest levels in the region and internationally on issues such as Afghanistan, 
the Afghan peace process, cooperation on counterterrorism, and bilateral relations. A career diplomat, His Excellency joined the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1991. He has served in British mission in Turkey, Argentina, Brussels, at the UK rep representation to the EU and India, where he was based at the UK Government Development Arm, Department for International Development, DFID. He has worked on diverse issues from Balkan Wars of the 1990s to climate change and economics with a consistent interest in international security. Outside his work, uh, His Excellency enjoys reading almost anything, but particularly novels, uh, popular science and history, outdoor pursuit, including climbing and sailing, at both of which he is rapidly being outclassed by his three children and traveling. And as a not Londoner, he support Arsenal. Oh. Our ambassador is the fans of Arsenal, and congratulations for Arsenal who just won the FA Cup for the 14 times, I believe. <laughs> Maybe next year we will won the Premier League then. We hope so. And His Excellency Mr. Owen Owen Jenkins will be accompanied by three other panelists, Mr. Dan Montgomery Han, uh, political counselor and education attache. Mrs. Mildred Ponto and Mr. F. Rizal Saputra. So uh, the arrangement for this lecture will be the presentation for about 30 minutes by the Mr. Ambassador, followed by Q&A for another 30 minutes. And for the information for the Mr. Ambassador, this lecture is followed by uh, our cadets from all over Indonesia, from Aceh until Jayapura from um, maritime transportation cadets, uh, land transportation cadets, and also aviation cadets. So without further ado, I would like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Owen Jenkins, to present the UK capabilities in transportation. His Excellency, the time is yours. Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. Uh, and any introduction which includes Arsenal winning the FA Cup um, is a good one uh, by my lights. So I'm very pleased that you, you managed to mention that. Uh, Bapak Sukiarjo, Head of Human Resources Development Agency on Transportation, Ministry of Transportation. Bapak Popik Montanasia, Secretary of the Agency for Human Resources Development on Transportation, Ministry of Transportation. Bapak Deri Aman, Head of the Centre for Partnership Facilitation and International Organisations, Ministry of Transportation. Distinguished Directors, Headmasters and Principals of uh, the Education Agencies under the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, distinguished Officials from the Ministry of Transportation and most importantly, Cadets or Taruna as I should say, uh, and Lecturers at the Ed Education Institutes under the Ministry of Transportation. Firstly, let me say how honoured and grateful I am to be given the chance to give this, uh, this general lecture on the UK's capabilities in, in transportation. Uh, as has been said, the UK has long been a leader in many areas of, of transportation, um, and I'm delighted to be able to share some of that experience today. And I'm particularly pleased uh, that we are doing so in an educational setting. Uh, I think as my lecture develops, you will see that the element that I put most emphasis on is the area of skills development. Of course, technology, infrastructure and other issues are extremely important in transportation, but without the human, right, the, the human resources uh, to, uh, to man that and to manage the systems, they will not function properly. His Excellency, the President's uh, emphasis on uh, human resources has already been mentioned, and as he often says, STM Ungul, Indonesia Machu. And that is exactly right, I think, uh, that with excellent human resources, Indonesia will advance. And in no sector is that more true than in the sector of transportation. The UK has particular strengths in the area of uh, uh, 
of, of transportation, particularly in education and skills development. That exists at the university level with high level research and development, uh, including high level innovation in all areas of transportation. But it also exists at other levels, including centres of excellence across uh, the UK, which can be based in industry or university. And those are perhaps the most important elements of our skills development uh, as, they, as they take forward the links between uh, industry, personnel of the transportation industry, government and academics. And only by having those connections can transportation sector advance. And this resonates very closely, I think, uh, with the Indonesian government's focus on the so-called link and match between industry and academia uh, to ensure that the very best innovation and the very best thinking is being taken forward in, uh, in the transportation sector. I can't see whether my slides are being shared at the moment, but if so, uh, can we go to slide two, please? Thank you very much. Uh, this slide uh, simply outlines what I'm going to talk about in the, in the lecture. Um, as you will see, over the top of the three sectors that I will cover is skills development. And as I've already said, that will be the underlying theme uh, for, uh, for the lecture. But I will talk specifically about um, the railway sector, uh, where I'll talk about urban transportation, particularly in London. Uh, we'll talk about railway centre of excellence, uh, which I've already mentioned about education and training and how that links into the Indonesia-UK partnership in this area. On the aviation side, I will talk largely about um, airport management, but I will talk a little bit about other, other areas of, of, transport, of, 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 of aviation. Uh, I will look at the center, two centres of excellence there, uh, one at Heathrow Airport and one at Cranfield University, which has strong and very historic links uh, with Indonesia. And last but not least, I'll talk about the maritime sector, giving a quick overview of, of the sector in which, of course, the UK has um, an extraordinarily rich history. Uh, we about the Skills for Prosperity programme, which we uh, run here in Indonesia, focusing on maritime skills development. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. This, this slide uh, sets out a very brief history of, of the UK transportation development and innovation. Um, it's not particularly far. Of course, British history in transportation goes a lot further back than that, uh, particularly with the development um, of the UK as a major maritime power through the 17th and 18th centuries and the first industrial canals uh, which were developed in the, in the 18th and early 19th centuries. But 1825 was an important moment because it was the first time uh, that a steam-driven railway was, was brought into, into use. Uh, and really the modern history of uh, UK capabilities in the transportation sector starts from, from that point. It developed through the 19th century with the development of, of railways, still driven by, by steam, uh, but quite quickly moved to electrification uh, as uh, the early, as the 20th century uh, developed, and particularly as urban transport began to, to settle in. On the aviation side, uh, the history of the UK as a major aviation player can really be linked back to about 1940, uh, when the UK became the largest manufacturer manufacturer of, of aircraft in the world. Uh, we developed uh, the very the first commercial airlines and transport of cargo uh, via aviation. On the maritime side, um, as the slide says, at one point, 25% of the entire world's trade was going through British ports. Uh, and our capability in that sector really develops from that period when we had a huge maritime um, fleet and an important infrastructure. The sector has of course evolved significantly since then, uh, but the UK remains a huge hub for uh, maritime affairs, including because the International Maritime Organization itself, the UN's specialist, specialist agency for maritime affairs, is based in London, um, at the center of a huge ecosystem, uh, both financial, technical, 
and practical um, for the maritime scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So before I talk about the three sectors uh, in particular, uh, let me just talk a little bit about the importance of skills across those three sectors. And the re reason that skills are so important in the transportation sector at the moment is because, the, because of the rapid pace of change across transportation, as in other sectors. There are, of course, a huge range of important skills which need to be possessed by anybody who aspires to work in the transportation sector. But I'd like to highlight three. The first is the skill set around the emergence of new technologies in transportation sector, again, as in other sectors, but in a very marked way in transport. New technology is disrupting and changing the way that transport is done. This is particularly important when one looks at the relevant data in transport. So we use information, we use huge data sets to drive transportation policy and So the first is the ability of those who work in the transportation sector to use big data and adapt to a rapid pace of technological change. The second skill set that I would highlight is that around those working in the sector to be able to innovate themselves. So if the first skill set is about reacting to others' innovation, the second is about seeing opportunities to change the sector yourself, not just to learn a single set of skills at the start and assume that that will run throughout a career. And then the third area is around communication skills. Uh, as you all know far better than I do, transportation is a huge and interconnected web of different skills, different sectors, different technologies and different people. And without the ability to communicate across that web, uh, transport will not happen. And I would particularly highlight the relevance of English language competency in this specialised sector, uh, which will enable transportation professionals to communicate well and in an appropriate specialised vocabulary with all of those other experts around the world who will have the same background. And English language, I think it's fair to say, is no longer just a language skill. It is a, an integral part of any professional career in the 21st century because it, because it is increasingly how the world communicates. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The UK itself has set out, <coughs> excuse me, um, its transport infrastructure skills in a strategy uh, which, uh, which looks forward. And this strategy is intended to build the sustainable skills that the UK knows we need in transport infrastructure over the next decade and more. And this strategy cuts across railways, aviation and maritime. <coughs> and one of the most important things that I would say is that it promotes employer-led standards for apprenticeships and other skills uh, with high quality training. And the reason that I emphasize the employer-led part of this is because in the UK, it is extremely important that industry leads on, uh, on defining these standards in collaboration with government and academic uh, institutions to area. We believe only by those three sectors and indeed others working together can we develop the new standards that we need uh, to, uh, to meet the needs of the 21st century, to develop the skills, the knowledge and the behaviours which are going to be required by the new, uh, by the new standards of the 21st century. We have around uh, 230 apprenticeship frameworks in the UK with over, over 700 pathways within them. And those are the diversity of the transportation sector and the needs for uh, a whole range of technical business administration and professionals across those areas. And in particular, we brought together a lot of this work in centres of excellence, which aim to be really world class leaders in developing teaching methods and the substance of curriculums to become the epicenters of what works best in all of these sectors. 
And we hope that those centres of excellence can also share their expertise globally to uh, ensure that the world's transportation sector develops. Because again, given the interlinks, interlinkages of this sector, it is not a sector where any one nation, whether that's the UK, Indonesia, or anyone else, can thrive alone. Next slide, please. I can't see the next slide coming up. I don't know if others can. Yes, uh, no. Uh, the next, the next one. No, that's still the skill strategy. Um, let me let me talk anyway, and I hope the slide will will come up. The if if you could see this slide, and I certainly can't. And then it will be talking about apprenticeships, which I've mentioned under the skills strategy. And the reason that uh, we have put apprenticeships at the centre of our uh, strategy for skills in the country and transport is because apprenticeships really bring together that link between industry, academia and government, which I've, which I've talked about already. Uh, we believe that they are the best route to develop that very wide range of skills that we that we need, uh, which will help us um, address the uh, the needs of the of the twenty first century. And uh, in accordance uh, with that, uh, we have encouraged the whole, uh, the whole range of sectors to uh, a whole range of industry to develop as apprenticeships programs. So these can come out of any size of business, and the slide which we're which we're currently missing um, focuses on the uh, the Crossrail Academy, uh, which uh, so Crossrail is the, the, the developing a huge rail project across uh, London from East to West, and the engineering business requirements are enormous a huge range of new actors and new skills in the transportation sector and the Crossrail uh, project alone has generated over, uh, since the start of the program in 2009 through to 2017 and I give that as an example uh, because I think it's a really positive one which shows how one project, one business if you like, can generate the sorts of skilled professionals which we which we need in the 21st century at scale, and it's done so across a whole range of uh, business requirements, um, from uh, classical uh, transportation needs such as civil, electrical, and mechanical engineering, but all the way through to uh, professional qualifications in accounting, accounting business administration, and also even as far as communications um, and public relations, which are, as you all know, well needed in the, uh, in the transportation sector as everywhere else. Uh, I'm not sure if we've got the slides uh, back, but if we have, uh, yeah, thank you. That's the slide I was talking about. Uh, and forward, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So I want to give an overview, I'll move now onto the uh, three sectors that I, I talked about at the beginning and I'll start with the, the rail sector um, and I can, I can go through this slide, uh, it highlights the fact that the first rail, railway built in the UK which used steam locomotives was in 1825. Uh, we also had the first high profile casualty of, of railways in 1830 uh, when a very senior politician uh, was killed by, uh, by the, the locomotive uh, as he attended the opening of the railway. Um, but our safety record has got much better since then um, and we have real strengths across these, these six areas uh, of capability uh, which I list on the slide. Um, so firstly around planning, design and project delivery. Uh, every transport project is immensely complex, uh, has to bring together a whole range of actors and we have some really world-class capability uh, in that area. On rail infrastructure, 
have a wide range of uh, users. Uh, I list some of them there who are able to supply across the world um, some of the, the highest quality and cutting edge technology, as well as more basic um, supplies. We have expertise in rolling stock as well uh, through a number of, of suppliers, again, listed on the slide. Um, we also have expertise in asset management. So how does one service maintain and renew assets and infra in particular infrastructure assets over a long period? And I think this is a skills development debate. Uh, without those skills in managing assets and keeping them running efficiently and effectively, um, the system will not work. So I think that's a really important one. It leads into the next one, it's operations. Um, so how does one run those operations? And again, we have uh, experts, particularly in the rail sector, but in other sectors too. And then finally, we have world-class training offer. So uh, we have a range of institutes, centers of excellence and academic institutions, uh, which can provide training and education across really any aspect of the railway sector. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, next. Uh, but before I do, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what the rail transport sector in the UK looks like. And as you would expect um, from a country that's been developing its rail sector since the 19th century, it is really a hugely well-developed uh, sector. So, Every major city in the UK is, is, of course, linked by rail. Almost all of them can be reached in um, five hours or under uh, from, from London, which is quite impressive. And every part of Great Britain can be reached from the capital in under 14 hours, simply by train and pedestrian transport, which is, uh, even for a country which is much smaller than in the huge Indonesia, is, I think, quite an impressive record. Uh, next one. And I just wanted to say a word about um, urban transport in the UK through a deep dive into the London transport system. Um, I'm, I'm a Londoner, as I've already said, and has already been said, uh, and it's, uh, it is a fully integrated uh, transportation system run by a group called Transport for London, which is the integrated authority for operating the whole uh, public transport network. Um, and this runs across a wide range of modes of transport. Um, and in the excellent introduction, um, we've already heard how, uh, how Bapak Spiaggio has used many of these from uh, the aviation side, but the London Underground, ground rail, buses, light railways, trams, river boats, uh, bicycles, and cable cars. And one of the things which I would highlight on this is the way that those are integrated to run effectively together. This is guided politically by the Mayor of London's uh, transport strategy and it's the very latest technology. Um, in particular, it was a pioneer, pioneering network in using a contactless payment card across the whole network and across different modes of transport. And any of you have, who've been to London will know that the Oyster card is the one thing that needs is going to be traveling in And one thing which I would particularly want to highlight about uh, the London transport system is its commitment to sustainability and becoming cleaner over time. So this slide highlights the hydrogen bus, um, 20 of which were ordered in 2019. Uh, to make uh, the London bus fleet zero emission. And those 20 are just part of a wider fleet of 165 zero buses. Uh, and we will be running uh, 68, hopefully more, ele fully electric double-decker buses on London streets uh, by this year. But the reason that hydrogen uh, is particularly interesting is because it can refuel much quicker. It can hold, it can hold much more fuel. Uh, than traditional uh, electric buses. Uh, it only needs to be um, refueled once a day, um, often unlike uh, electrical buses, which need to be refueled every time. Uh, and we think there's real potential in the hydrogen technology which we've developed in the UK. 
It also incidentally helps improve air quality, uh, which has been a real problem in London because the vehicle emissions are only water. Uh, next slide, please. So the bus that I've just talked about and the integration of the London transport system are something which I think are really important as one thinks about innovation in the transport sector more widely. And I want now to turn to the way that we structure our skills development in the UK in the rail sector in this instance uh, to think about those and other, um, and other issues. And to do that, we, we are setting up uh, what's called the UK Research and Innovation, UK Rail Research and Innovation Network, UK RRIN, uh, which was uh, set up in the club, an avenue uh, for universities to collaborate among themselves, but also with government and business in thinking about innovation in the railway sector. It's been established to create three new centres of excellence. So a centre of excellence in digital systems, a centre of excellence in rolling stock, and a centre of excellence in infrastructure. And the slide sets out which, uh, which universities um, and others are engaged in those centres of excellence. The reason that we picked those three areas are, I mean, firstly, digital systems are going to be at the heart of any new, uh, any existing railway system. Uh, smart monitoring, the use of big data and autonomous systems are going to be critical to railway structures in a way that they haven't been previously. So we think there's a real need for a centre of excellence in that area. Rolling stock, although it is in many ways a very traditional industry, is going to change significantly over the next few years. And so this centre of excellence aims to meet not only the current but also the future demands of the British and we hope the global rail industry for research and innovation into the next generation of railway vehicles. Areas of focus in this area will include energy optimization techniques which will be particularly important in sustainability and also be tested for low carbon emission vehicles and more sustainable vehicles. And finally, on infrastructure, here, the research that the Centre of Excellence will do is being applied to develop a reliable seven day service with world class asset management, increased capacity and reduced delays. The civil engineering in this is being addressed primarily at our National Infrastructure Laboratory at Southampton University, as well as, as at existing facilities at other universities around the UK. And I'm particularly proud that my own alma mater, Sheffield University, is at the heart of this, addressing some of the rail and power infrastructure components which will be needed for the next phase. And again, all of these collaborations bring together academia, as I've talked about, the university sector, but also industry and government to make sure that all of the needs of the stakeholders are taken into account. And I'll explain a little bit more about the Centre of Excellence on Digital Systems at the University of Birmingham. So next, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Hello, can we go on to the next slide, please? Uh, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Ambassador, we're having a uh, disruption with the technology. <laughs> Sorry for... No, still, don't worry. Oh. Don't worry. Um, these, this is... Uh, I should digress and just say I think this lecture shows both the advantages and the, and the disadvantages of, of remote working. Yeah. Um, that only through this new technology could I be addressing an audience of thousands across Indonesia's extraordinary archipelago of 18,000 islands so produce more technology. Thank you very much for uh, for your efforts. And this is this is the slide that I was talking about, which is uh, the the slide on the uh, Centre of Excellence in Digital Systems at the University of Birmingham. Uh, and in this uh, Centre of Excellence, it intends to focus on all aspects of digital railway innovation. Uh, and it does that because 
uh, it believes that it needs to provide a system-wide approach to uh, systems integration and really transformational research, development and innovation, rather than simply focusing on a single uh, area of digital innovation with the integration across the systems. So that means focusing on the list of things that you can see on the slide. So future railway operations, how those are controlled, uh, data integration and cyber security, which with critical national infrastructure like the price is more important to the uh, uh, cyber attacks uh, which has which has suffered um, and smart monitoring and autonomous systems uh, which we believe are going to become ever more important as robotic and autonomous systems are developed um, ever more rapidly in all sectors uh, but monitoring those um, systems will be particularly important and we believe that all of those systems have a really important role to play in developing a railway system for the 21st century, which is more cost efficient, more resilient and robust, uh, more customer friendly, and very importantly, more uh, sustainable and lower carbon. Um, so we, we believe that by integrating these areas of technological focus, uh, we can make huge strides in addressing uh, those challenges which I've, which I've talked about. Uh, next slide, please. And the Centre of Excellence um, also links up with the uh, much longer established centre at Birmingham for railway research and education. And this is a provider of um, skills development across the railway sector in the UK and has a, uh, a very successful track record in, in doing this. Um, and I'd like to highlight here its, its role in providing some of that expertise uh, internationally uh, by providing um, short courses um, in uh, continuing professional development, which can be as short as a week or two weeks, but also can be um, much longer partnerships uh, between the centre and other academic uh, or industrial institutes. Uh, if there is a need for a bespoke or a tailored course uh, to deliver courses, for example, as they're doing in Singapore um, on urban railway engineering. And one of the strengths of the, this Birmingham Centre is its ability to uh, to blend learning, so to bring together academic expertise with real life experiences drawn on industrial partners, whether from the UK or um, through international partners. And the examples here are in Singapore and, and Dubai. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm cantering through this. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Uh, but moving quickly to, to aviation, uh, again, this slide sets out uh, the range of UK aviation uh, sectors, uh, UK aviation expertise, which are as wide as you would expect um, from the country, which had the first um, uh, significant commercial airline and really pioneered a lot of the development of commercial uh, airline travel. Um, and that runs through architecture, engineering solutions, airport equipment, airport operators, and again, this crucial element of skills development and training, uh, where a wide range of British institutions uh, have been involved in, in providing training for a, a very long time, including um, right here in, in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I'll focus down on a couple of centres of excellence in the UK just to show how we've how we've used our capabilities to develop integrated uh, training and uh, innovation. So this centre of excellence, unlike the Birmingham examples which I've just, just just described, is based out of a business out of Heathrow Airport, and uh, that works extremely well because being based in an airport means that it can really be a hub not only of learning, but of exploiting the lived experience um, of uh, air travel. And the uh, Heathrow Airport uh, Centre of Excellence really recognises that airports and airlines and aviation more widely are going to change quite dramatically over the next few years. And that's without taking into account the impact of COVID-19 on, uh, on, on those sectors. So innovation, but also collaboration across perhaps the best example of a genuinely international business are critical. 
And the Heathrow Centre of Excellence starts from uh, what they call the plan for Heathrow 2.0. And this is a plan uh, for sustainable growth to keep Heathrow as one of the world's leading airports, but in, in a more sustainable way, because we all know that the, the current level of emissions and the current level of sustainability in the, air, in the aviation sector will not be adequate as we try to fight the challenge of, of climate change. And like the Birmingham Centre, although starting from a different point, the Heathrow Centre of Excellence does this by bringing together universities with industry, entrepreneurs and others to make sure that all of the best thinking in the UK and globally is being brought, brought to bear on these challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, while we're waiting for the next slide to come up, um, which I'm sure it will in a moment, uh, it's, uh, yeah, um, this is just one example of, of what Heathrow has pioneered, which is using facial recognition to speed passengers through um, the, uh, the airport. So we all know how slow and how difficult the regular checks which are needed to show boarding passes, passports and so on at airports can be. So this biometric project is designed really to abolish that. So once a passenger is checked in, uh, they can go straight through the airport to boarding without any further checks. And not only is this more efficient and quicker for the passenger, we also believe it's more secure uh, because uh, facial biometrics are more accurate than manual checks. Right, uh, that was, I just wanted to give that example quickly because I think it's an interesting one, but let's let's go on to the, uh, the next slide, please, which is the next center of excellence um, that I wanted to talk about uh, briefly. Um, so again, this is a, um, uh, a second center of excellence, again, based at a university. Um, and Cranfield University is one of the UK's really, um, really leading universities in aviation. Uh, uh, it's uh, I'm very proud to say, um, has close links with, with Indonesia and was uh, one of the universities in the UK to give an honorary doctorate to His Excellency, the late President Habibi, uh, to recognize the very strong links between Cranfield and the aviation sector in, in Indonesia. Um, and Cranfield's uh, center of excellence, uh, which is called the Urban, Urban Turbine, is, uh, is slightly different from the ones we've, we've talked about so far. And that's why I wanted to talk about it because it's, it's really a research project which is, which is not about integration in quite the way that I've talked about. It is focusing on how, uh, how to innovate in an airport uh, sector. So how can new airport business models be developed to provide a, a better customer experience, reduce carbon emissions, and a more efficient process for all parts of the airport experience. So this slide sets out uh, what that looks like. And really it's aiming at creating a seamless experience for, uh, for passengers. Firstly, by detaching bags from passengers. So instead of integrating baggage handling in the airline process, it's looking at whether baggage handling and baggage transport can be integrated in wider logistics chains so that passengers can have a smoother end-to-end -end experience. It also looks at how passengers move uh, to and from the airport. So how can airports really exploit development of driverless cars and other autonomous transport opportunities to make sure that people who travel to, um, uh, to airports for travel, but also those working there can have a more seamless experience. And how can the experience in the airport itself be made more rapid? Um, we've just looked at the biometric uh, opportunities there. Uh, but the urban turbine at Cranfield University is looking at a whole range of things uh, which uh, might speed up uh, boarding and the other elements of the passenger moving through the airport, uh, which as we know can, provide, can, can impose quite significant delays um, on airlines and can in, uh, introduce additional costs as well into the airport and airline systems. So Urban Turbine believes that there's a huge 
potential for um, savings, both in costs, in carbon emissions, and also a more secure process, which can be uh, stimulated and developed by, uh, uh, by a more integrated approach to the airport experience. So again, I'm using that word uh, integration, but it's uh, in a slightly different way. This is a sort of vertical integration, if you like, rather than seeking to look across the whole sector. Next slide, please. So this briefly um, is what the UK footprint uh, looks like, or a very few examples of what the UK and Indonesia are doing together in the transport sector. Um, and I put it in at this uh, stage because it's most, these examples are mostly in the, uh, the railway or urban transport and aviation sectors. And as you can see from the slide, there's a huge range of uh, engagement on this. So this ranges from the introduction of hydrogen technology uh, to the Asian Games uh, in 2018, but also uh, through our, our, our contacts and the sister city relationship, which Liverpool has with, with Surabaya last year. And I was delighted to have conversations uh, with my colleagues in Surabaya on that. Um, there are a number of agreements between the UK and Indonesia on this. So a consortium of British firms um, and PT Karata Api signed um, a letter of intent uh, to take forward cooperation in, in the rail sector. Uh, there's an MOU on capacity building on, on HR development, which is hugely relevant to today's lecture, which is between Crossrail, which I've talked about today, and MRT uh, Jakarta. There's quite a range of um, engagement in the aviation sector, uh, which goes from uh, master planning through sustainability and uh, even through to the chairs at the new uh, Sakano Hatta Terminal 3, uh, which are British, uh, British design and British, British made. So again, that picks up the breadth of the UK capabilities in this area. And then finally, UK firms are directly involved in providing services to very specific and very important Indonesian infrastructure projects, such as Jakarta's MRT and LRT. Uh, but it's not just about Jakarta. Uh, we're also involved in Batam um, and across the archipelago. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and now I'll move on to, to maritime. Uh, and the first thing to say here is that, of course, the UK is genuinely one of the uh, world's leading maritime uh, centres. Uh, we have an extraordinary maritime heritage in the UK, which has meant that, as I said in, in, in at the very start of the lecture, that London in particular, but also other cities such as, uh, such as Liverpool and Glasgow, are really world leading centres um, for a whole range of maritime services. This is particularly true in the workforce, I think, um, that the skills development in the maritime sector in the UK is a, a quite remarkable uh, success story. It can be better, of course, and I'll say a few words about how we're doing that, uh, but it is really uh, one of the places in the world where a skilled workforce across the whole range of maritime needs is, is in place. And that's a long time, alongside the other areas of uh, maritime uh, uh, maritime sector needs, which, uh, which are also present in the UK, such as the cutting edge technology, high quality design and manufacturing, but also a lot of other um, perhaps softer skills around finance, asset management, uh, and so on. Um, but, but despite that, we are very ambitious to move the maritime sector forward. And we believe that um, the maritime sector is going to be only more important in the 21st century. So we're keen to continue to develop our skilled workforce. One of the most important areas that we want to do that is by improving the diversity of uh, our maritime workforce. Um, so uh, the maritime sector is, is very strongly male dominated. We want to change that so that we're drawing on the, the full range of skills available to us. And again, we're using apprenticeships and high quality training in the maritime sector, as we are in other sectors. We're also pushing for really cutting edge innovation in the maritime sector through, a, uh, through this, the establishment of what we call the Maritime Research and Innovation UK initiative. This uh, is an industry-led initiative. Uh, it involves industries, 
trade associations and universities to make sure that things are better coordinated. Because again, as in the maritime sector, as in the other sectors I've talked about, we believe that there is insufficient coordination between the different actors and also insufficient resources being put uh, to research and development in the maritime sector. So uh, that's one of the initiatives that we're, we're taking in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an, a second initiative which would, I would highlight, which is the UK Maritime 2050 strategy. This, this aims to support and to grow the UK's maritime sector all the way through to 2050. Um, so it highlights the need for uh, greater innovation in the sector, again, by bringing together universities, small and medium enterprises and the global companies present in the UK, but also uh, academic and uh, institutional actors to, again, to make sure that we are properly integrating. The plan which underpins this strategy focuses on a number of areas, um, and in particular, I would highlight uh, zero emission shipping and ambition uh, which addresses the need to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in the maritime sector, uh, not least by taking advantage of the rapid changes which we're seeing in the technology uh, of, maritime, uh, of the maritime sector to make the sector cleaner, yes, but also safer and more efficient. And the recommendations under this strategy for the short term, which is up to five years, the medium term, which is five to 15 years, and even out to 2050 itself, so in the very long term. Uh, and these will be underpinned by a series of thematic uh, route maps. So there's a lot of information under this strategy, which I think could be really interesting for Indonesia. I'm just sorry I don't have time to go into it at this point. Uh, and now um, for my last four slides, I just want to talk about um, a uh, a program which we're running here in Indonesia, uh, which is called Skills for Prosperity. Uh, next slide, please. So Skills for Prosperity is a, uh, a regional program which the British government is running, uh, not just in Indonesia, uh, but also in Malaysia and the Philippines. And the goal is really to work very closely with the government of Indonesia uh, to increase national capacity to develop uh, the sector and to achieve really sustained growth. And we plan to do so by focusing on skills development and in particular on technical and vocational education systems. Um, and we're delighted and extremely grateful to the Indonesian government uh, for its collaboration in this area. We believe that it's, it's an area which, uh, where the UK strengths and, the U and Indonesia's incredible position as what His Excellency the President has called uh, the maritime can really come together and find a lot of synergy. And these, uh, the four areas uh, which are set out in this slide, are the four areas which we which we are trying to work on in this uh, in this uh, program. Uh, next slide, please. So the first two areas uh, which we're focusing on um, are firstly uh, supporting the English language skills and uh, the UK obviously has um, a particular advantage in this area as I'm proud to say. Um, so we're really focusing on supporting Indonesian polytechnics to strengthen vocational in English across logistics, seafarers, shipbuilding and maritime economy because as I said at the start the English language is not just a language it is the language of communication among, among global professionals and I think the maritime sector shows that particularly clearly, where English is, of course, um, globally used. The second is to, uh, to work with the government of Indonesia on its own efforts to, uh, to strengthen national stand standards and the qualification framework by really looking um, uh, across Indonesian frameworks and international quality frameworks to ensure that the future professionals in Indonesia in the world are getting qualifications which will enable them to go out into the global maritime sector and compete at that level. Uh, next slide, please. I've already mentioned this um, uh, gender equality issue, uh, and this is something which the UK 2050 maritime strategy is really focusing on, uh, but we're also keen to work on in Indonesia, and I've really welcomed the very positive reaction which we've had 
both from our government and institutional partners on this. Uh, this, this draws on um, international maritime organization work to help the industry move forward uh, in, in gender equality. And it's really about empowering women. And this isn't just a, um, a sort of fashionable cause, which we think is worth following. It's because if women represent only 2% of uh, the world's 1.2 million seafarers, then we are not collectively drawing on all the skills which are available, all of the talent which is available to us uh, in this crucial sector. And we think we need to do so. So we've incorporated the International Maritime Organization's work in this area, and we hope that uh, our experience, which is not all positive, we've had many failures too, uh, can be helpful to Indonesia as it, as it follows the same pathway. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, and this I think you will have seen is a bit of a theme for me, is we're focusing on industry engagement under the Skills for Prosperity program. So how does one ensure uh, that when we're thinking about developing skills, when we're thinking about curriculum development or applying international standards across institutions, how can we make sure that industry is fully involved in that so that there is, uh, so that the skills which are developed are relevant to the, uh, to the needs of industry, both today and in the future. And to that end, we're helping to support the development of the Indonesian, Indonesia Maritime Sector Skills Council. Uh, and we hope that there will be a really fruitful exchange between Indonesia's council and the UK Sector Skills Council, uh, where we can uh, engage in mutual uh, lessons learning, uh, because we think we have a lot to learn from Indonesia as as well as vice versa, vice versa, as well as providing technical support uh, to develop and strengthen industry engagement with a wide range of education institutions, which I hope will include many of those uh, present here today. Um, that's my last slide. Um, so let me close uh, by saying that I hope that's been helpful. I'm conscious I've, I've spoken for quite a long time, but I hope we can also engage in a bit of a question and answer session next um, to talk this through. Um, I hope it's been of some interest. Uh, uh, um, there is a huge amount, uh, I think, that Indonesia and the UK can do together. And as I said right at the start of my lecture, I'm incredibly grateful uh, to the Ministry of Transportation and to His Excellency, the Minister in particular, for giving me this opportunity uh, to give this general lecture and for picking up when we met um, in our meeting in January on the real potential for the UK and Indonesia to work much more closely together in this area of education, technical and vocational skills, and general skills development in the transportation sector. With that, I will close. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Um, and I apologize for all of my mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, for a very comprehensive presentation of UK transportation development and strategy, the link between the government, the transportation industry, and the academia. You, has given, uh, you have given us the insight about how the development of the mode of transportation from traditional one into the uh, environment-friendly uh, transport. And from your presentation, we learned that the importance of developing competencies due to the changing technology, technological landscape, the importance of the innovation and the communication skill, uh, primarily English language skills. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, for the next uh, Q&A session, uh, we have uh, many uh, students want to ask about your presentation, so I'll open the Q&A uh, following your, the order of your presentation. So we'll start with the uh, railway or land transportation. So I currently open the first session for three questions. First one is from Madiun, the second one from Tegal, and the third one is from Palembang. So the cadets who want to ask uh, Mr. Ambassador, kindly please uh, uh, convey your questions. First one is from Madiun, please.
Good afternoon. Excuse me, sir. Let me introduce. Let me introduce myself. My name is Muda Kadet Artika Dewi Anisa from Indonesian Railway Polytechnic. Good afternoon. As we know, as we know that the coronavirus pandemic or COVID-19 has negative and positive impact especially on the environment. For example, it was reported by National Geography that within a period of 100 years, the peak of the Alpine mountain could be seen from, from Paris, France. Regarding the positive impact on the environment, two European countries, especially UK, have a plan to accelerate the use of energy source to renewable energy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kadet Kartika. Uh, so, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you want to directly answer the question or we collect from the second and the third question? No, let me, let me answer that. And thank you very much for, for the question. I think it's, a, it's an excellent question and goes to a lot of what I was talking about in the, in the uh, uh, in my lecture. Um, so yes, we have a lot, of, a lot of plans in place to develop renewable energy um, schemes uh, and this is very relevant in the, in the transportation sector. And the UK uh, has a very long and dirty history in, in burning very high carbon uh, fuels. So we were the first coal superpower uh, back in the, in the 19th century. Um, and we want to make amends for that by moving very quickly uh, away from heavy fossil fuels. Um, and I think the important thing uh, as we go through this horrendous um, coronavirus experience is to recognize the opportunities. As, as your question um, said, there are some upsides in this. So as we come out of the coronavirus epidemic, let's build back better. Let's find ways of uh, continuing to grow our economies, of course, uh, we need growth, we need high quality jobs, uh, we need wages, um, but let's do so in a, lower, uh, in, in a lower carbon way. And the UK is very proud that uh, we've shown this is possible. So um, since 1990, we have reduced our carbon emissions uh, by uh, about 46%, and so nearly halved our carbon emissions. But at the same time, we've grown our economy by 70%. And that's as a mature economy with much lower growth rates than a country like Indonesia. So we, we know it's possible. Our electricity system, uh, which even I think about eight years ago was burning coal, uh, perhaps for about 40% of power generation, is now not burning coal at all. We've just gone about 70 days with no coal in our mix. So we've shown that it is possible to move to renewables, many of which are cheaper uh, than uh, heavy fossil fuels. And as we electrify more of our modes of transport, cleaning up our electricity supply is a very rapid way to move to a more renewable energy uh, heavy system. So I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, uh, the next question will be delivered by cadets from Tegal. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fatah Safafian, and what I would like to ask to you is about electric vehicles or EV have several environmental benefits compared to a conventional internal combustion engine cars. For example, lower operating and maintenance costs, lower local air pollution, reduce all uh, oil consumption, and also potentially potentially reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So how does the government encourage the use of electric vehicles? Thank you. Okay, thank you, candidates, for the questions uh, about uh, how does the UK government encourage the industry to use the electric vehicle? Please, Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Mas, that 
electric vehicles will be a huge part of the future of, of transportation. And the UK government, like the Indonesian government, um, uh, provides support to the development of the electric vehicles in a number of ways. Uh, so firstly, uh, the government sponsors a lot of research in this area, uh, because one of the things that we've really uh, uh, come to understand is that the government has a, an incredibly important role in stimulating the basic research and innovation needed to develop an industry like electric vehicles, which is, which is quite new. The second thing that we've done is a series of programs to uh, roll out infrastructure uh, to allow electric vehicles to be, uh, to be deployed more, more widely. Um, so this ranges from uh, the public transportation infrastructure, some of which I talked about uh, earlier, to putting in place charging points and uh, infrastructure for private transportation through, through EVs. And then the third area, which I think is, is really important, we haven't really talked about today, is, is regulation. Um, so I think that as one thinks about uh, the question of EVs, there are a whole question, there are a whole set of questions around how one regulates transport in a new era uh, when one has uh, different vehicles, perhaps autonomous vehicles coming through as well. Um, perhaps with hydrogen fuels, which pose different safety risks to uh, traditional fuels and so on. So I think the government has a real role in thinking about this holistically and making sure that the legislative and regulatory framework is in place to encourage research and to encourage uh, the take up of this new technology, which, as you say, I think has a real role to play um, in making our transportation system cleaner, as well as hopefully more efficient. Thank you. Uh, okay, for following the cadet question, I want to ask uh, one question. Is there any incentive uh, provided by the UK government for the people or industry who use uh, the electrical vehicle for their uh, daily operations? Like in Indonesia, I, uh, I know that uh, government will give incentive if people use uh, electrical vehicle that will like uh, cut for the uh, electricity cost maybe for some some percent. Is there any uh, like a same incentive or maybe other incentive provided by UK government? Uh, yes, um, there is really good really good question. Um, so. It's not quite the same as in Indonesia, um, so it's not it's not an electricity subsidy. But for example, um, in in my hometown London, um, there is a congestion charge. So cars which drive into the centre of London have to pay quite a significant charge uh, in order to do so, uh, which is enforced by uh, smart monitoring. Electric vehicles are exempt from that, uh, so uh, they they can go in, they can park in different places as well. There are also a number of schemes uh, to encourage people to buy <coughs> electric electric vehicles. So there are there have been some some subsidies around that, um, and other local authorities around the UK have also put in place regional schemes, if you like, uh, to uh, to make it easier for people to use electric vehicles. So again, it's providing incentives by allowing them to park in places that traditional vehicles can't park. To allow them to drive into areas where others can't uh, can't drive, in particular for for deliveries, um, and some tax incentives uh, at a local level as well. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's not a joined up national scheme in the way that Indonesia is, but but there are a number of incentives which are in place. Okay. Thank thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, for the first session, the last one is from Palembang. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the chance that you've given to me. My name is Dea Mirandi, and I'm from Inland Water and Various Transport Polytechnic of Palembang. I have some questions here, and my questions are, can you tell us about United Kingdom Climate Change Prevention Programs that affect the citizens' daily activities, and how the government ensures the citizens will comply with the program? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the questions about the UK prevention program in for the climate change. Uh, so this, uh, that, that would be a subject for a lecture in its own right. Um, the UK has a very wide range of, of climate change uh, programs, but I will say what I can. Um, so 
the first and most important thing I would say um, on what the programmes are, um, are that the UK has set some very ambitious targets and put them into law. So the UK has committed itself to become a uh, net zero emissions economy uh, by 2050. And we have empowered uh, an independent committee to give government recommendations on how we do that. Uh, in pursuit of that, the government is uh, putting in place a wide range of programmes. A lot of these are around the decarbonisation of electricity supply at this stage. And I've already talked about a, a little bit about how that's, how that's looked. Um, and we've done that both at a, an industrial scale uh, by encouraging the major electricity producers to increase their levels of renewable. And that's through some familiar uh, uh, regulatory schemes, including feed-in feed tariffs but also a, a very well-functioning carbon market uh, between uh, different actors. But we've also done it at a household level by encouraging individuals and landowners to uh, generate renewable electricity. So, for example, my parents took advantage of a government scheme to put solar panels on their roof um, and are generating electricity that way. So in terms of the second part of your question about how we make sure that uh, individuals comply with this. A lot of that is about incentives, so encouraging people positively to take up uh, more renewable and more sustainable opportunities such as a feed-in tariff for households uh, to, to use solar panels. Some of it is about putting the onus on, on big business, so for example the, the plastic bag ban on supermarkets which exists in the UK as it does in Indonesia is for the supermarkets to, to impose. So it doesn't require individuals to do anything, it requires the big businesses uh, to do things. But thirdly, there is uh, the, a set of incentives on individuals to move away from heavy fossil fuel usage, for example, by quite heavy taxes on, on petrol and diesel, uh, which incentivize the use of hybrids or, or electric vehicles. So there's a whole range of, of activities and incentives out there and a, um, uh, uh, but I think the important thing to say is that this is all part of a, a very comprehensive national plan which is aimed at achieving the long-term goal which is completely decarbonizing our economy because without that long-term goal I think we wouldn't have been able to put in place that comprehensive system. Sorry that's only a very partial answer to your question but it, it was a very big question so I hope that, I hope that will do. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, that's all question for the first uh, arrangement for, for the first session about the uh, railway or land transportations. We'll move forward for the aviation uh, session. So for the aviation, we will have uh, cadets from Surabaya, Jayapura, and Banyuwangi for, for the first one. Uh, I kindly invite the cadets from uh, Surabaya to deliver uh, their questions. Are they ready from Surabaya? Um, maybe we can uh, go to Jayapura first. Maybe Mr. Barawi, maybe the wrong uh, access uh, given to us. Uh, sorry? Uh, Surabaya, Mr. Setio? Uh, excuse me, maybe uh, the next uh, question. Uh, uh, after, after Jayapura, I mean? Okay, uh, after Jayapura. Okay, after Jayapura. So the first uh, uh, for aviation session will be presented by uh, questions by Jayapura. If Jayapura. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Girvini Apriantiaga. I am cadet from Jayapura Aviation Polytechnic from course Air Traffic Management. 
For your information, Jayapura Aviation Polytechnic has diploma programs which are air traffic management, airport electrical engineering, and airport management. Are there any suitable job opportunities for all these competences in the UK? For your condition, for your consideration, we have learned the lesson based on the standard, which is adopted from international regulations issued by ICAO. Is there any other standard qualification or requirements to be fulfilled to have a job there? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for the questions uh, about is there any opportunities from uh, Indonesian to work uh, in UK, especially in the aviation sectors? Yeah, um, so a very practical question and, and a good one, uh, and I think shows the international nature of the aviation uh, sector. So, so yes, there are plenty of, of, of opportunities in, in the UK. Uh, as I've said, the, the UK aviation sector is, is a very broad one uh, with, with opportunities across the sorts of areas which, uh, which you described in your, in your question. Um, I think it's great that uh, the, the qualifications which you're gaining are already drawing on ICAO standards and international um, standards because it is really that which I think is at the heart of uh, you know, getting a job abroad in, in the aviation sector. Uh, it's why we are constantly working with the government of Indonesia um, on a range of areas to try to make sure um, that standards are comparable across uh, technical and vocational education areas. Um, obviously, the standards which are required will vary from, from job to job. Um, it, will, it will depend on which sector or which, which part of the sector uh, you're, you're looking to work on. Uh, but if the course that you're undergoing meets the international standards for that particular area, that should be uh, enough to, uh, to, to get you into the competition. Um, I would say, of course, that, that job, job opportunities in the aviation sector in the UK as in Indonesia are very sought after. Um, but I would love to see more uh, connections between Indonesia and, and the UK in this area. So if you are thinking of that, um, then, then good luck. Um, and I hope we can, we can help you uh, once you are looking at particular, particular opportunities. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And of course, uh, English is mandatory to work in the UK. Of course, of okay. course. Well, I should have said that, but yes. <laughs> okay, uh, next question from Surabaya. Is Surabaya ready? Okay, please. Okay. Uh, no, you're still muted. Okay, can you unmute yourself? Because we cannot hear you. Okay, okay, let's we move to Banyuwangi first. Because we cannot hear anything from you. From Banyuwangi? Radio check Banyuwangi? We cannot hear you. Can you unmute yourself first, Lee? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm from the Central Polytechnic of Surabaya. Oh. Okay, Surabaya or Banyuwangi first? <laughs> Surabaya. Oh, Surabaya. Okay, okay. Okay, Surabaya, please. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. And I would like to say thank you for Mr. Awan for your great presentation. Because from it, I have a new, a lot of uh, perspective. Okay, thank you. And before I'm asking my question, let me introduce more myself. My name is Agus Putrawitama from Aviation Polytechnic of Surabaya. Uh, my question is, uh, will you give me some advice about what should we prepare for applying an aviation job, uh, especially in your country? Uh, maybe the hard skill, soft skill, our mental or our physical? Because uh, we know Indonesia and British have a different work culture atmosphere. So, what so we prepare specifically in Sarawak? Thank you. Thank you, Karet Agus, for the questions. Uh, again, continuing from the first question, uh, asking about maybe more detail about what should they prepare if they want to work in U the UK. 
Yeah, so Kada uh, Ergos, thank you, thank you very much. And let me just say, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the ability to switch from Palembang to Surabaya to Jayapura um, in, the, in one lecture. I think this is an amazing demonstration of, of technology defeating distance. Um, so, uh, Mas Agus, thank you, thank you very much. I would go back to, uh, to what I said earlier in my lecture, which is <clears throat> to focus on the three skill sets that I that I talked about. So, of course, you need to be um, skilled and professional in your particular professional area. That goes without saying. Um, we all need our professional qualifications. But I think the soft skills uh, which I described. Um, are particularly important in a UK context. Um, so firstly, an ability to, uh, to manage constant innovation, particularly around the use of data. Uh, so I think that the transportation sector and aviation, perhaps in particular, is going to be driven by the data revolution, by the use of, of huge data sets uh, to, uh, to change the way operations are, are run. So an ability to manage that. Secondly, a, a creativity, an ability to innovate, I think is important. So again, this is perhaps different to the traditional ways which the UK and other countries have, have taught. So it's not about learning a set of uh, information, it's about being able to be creative and to to change the way one, one works because the world in 20 years time is going to look very different um, to the world today. Uh, so an ability to create new ways of working around that uh, will be important. And then thirdly, uh, an ability to communicate, including, um, as I was reminded on, in English, um, that the transportation uh, business, like any sector, is in the end about an ability to communicate with other people, uh, that however good we are technically at particular things, unless we can communicate what we want and what we need um, to others involved in the same sector uh, in a way that uh, enables them to do it, it won't happen. Uh, so I think focus on communication skills. So uh, this is not to downplay the technical side of education at all, as I said at the start, that, that knowing and being genuinely expert to a global standard in whatever technical specialization you choose is, is an absolute requirement, of course, for, for any of us. But I think those soft skills are the ones which I would particularly highlight when thinking about a UK context and a UK workplace, because those are increasingly valued uh, by employers uh, in, in the UK. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. So you highlighted at least uh, the, for the cadets or for the people who want to work it at UK, at least to master three competencies. The first one is technical competencies. Second one is the, to be creative, creativity, and the last one is about uh, communications. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And for the aviation session, the last uh, question is from Banyuwangi. Okay, Banyuwangi, please. There is no sound from Banyuwangi. Good afternoon. My name is Lilan. I am from Indonesia Civil Pilot Academy, one of Indonesian government character for human resource as aviators. Talk about seaplane. We are going to observe that aircraft. Seaplanes are fixed wing aircraft able to take off and land from water. Two main types exist, float plane and flying boats. The first being conventional aircraft fitted with float instead of wheel. And the second aircraft with the fish sledge partially submerged in the water to provide the main source of buoyance as well as pilot and payload accommodation. Question are, the first, how was seaplane growing in UK? And how is the rules? The second one is Indonesia as we know together, that country consists of island, which is need to see transport to connect each other island. How do you think that is a sequence as the answer? Thank you. Thank you, Kadat Ilan, for the question about the seaplane. So, Banyuwangi is the pilot school, uh, so it's, uh, only educate or train the, the pilot there. So, they want to 
develop about seaplane program. So the question is how the development of uh, seaplane uh, in the UK. Okay, please, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Cadet Vilan. I think that's a, it's a good question. It's, it's one I perhaps have less to say on. Um, I think you've set out very clearly why seaplanes are a uh, potentially really positive answer to uh, many of the transportation needs in Indonesia because of the archipelagic nature of, of Indonesia. In the UK, I think they're, they're less used. Um, we have uh, a lot of islands, uh, but they are, um, uh, you know, most people live in the mainland in, in the UK. Um, there is a use of seaplanes between um, Glasgow and uh, Oban, so the western side of, of Scotland, uh, where many of our more remote islands are, are, are located. Uh, and I'm sure we would be happy to uh, to develop work on making a connection there if that if that were useful. Uh, but it is a less significant part of um, uh, the UK's own transportation uh, network than I can see it should be in, in Indonesia. And it's not something which uh, which my embassy has has worked on significantly as as yet. Though I'm sure we would be happy to if if there were a requirement uh, for collaboration between our two governments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the explanation about the maybe not so, so many seaplane uh, uh, in the UK. Okay, uh, that's all for the FSN sessions. And the next one, or the last one session, the last session is about the maritime. So we have uh, three schools. Uh, the first one is uh, Barombong, and please prepare, prepare after Barombong the Makassar and. The last one will be from Sorong. So I invite the first uh, question from Barombong. Okay, Kadet, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Excuse me, sir. Thanks for the chance to has been given to me. My name is Aldi Husky from Barombong Maritime Polytechnic. And the question is, facing the industrial era 4.0, how the efforts of the UK to prepare and develop its human resources, especially in the field of sea transportation supplies to support growth and maintain economic stability? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Kadet Rizky from Barombong. Please, Ambas Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Kadet. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think that um, you're right to place uh, the maritime sector in the context of the broader industry 4.0 uh, revolution, which we're all going through, uh, because I think the maritime sector will continue to be absolutely central uh, to uh, the networks which we rely on um, in this new industrial era. Uh, COVID-19 has shown how supply chains can be vulnerable, but I think um, actually maritime supply chains are much more robust and resilient um, than uh, perhaps aviation has, has proved to be. So I think maritime will, will be there. Uh, you're also right, I think, that uh, this new industrial era will require a different set of skills. Uh, and I will go back to, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the lecture, the 2050 maritime strategy which the UK has set out, which was intended really to, to recognise that we are going into a new era, that new skills uh, will be needed, uh, and to adapt the skills uh, development and the skills provision um, that UK institutions provide in order to meet those, those new skills. Uh, it will also obviously focus on the diversity and gender equality aspects that I, that I talked about. And I think that the, what, what we're doing, as well as focusing on the technical needs of today, we're also trying to understand what Industry 4.0 will mean for the maritime sector over the coming years, and to make sure that our students are educated in a way which allows them to adapt to innovations which perhaps we don't know about yet. Uh, so that, that flexibility, that response to innovation, which I've talked about previously, is embedded in, in our systems. And we hope that that's something that we can share with Indonesia through the Skills for Prosperity program, which I talked about in my, in my final slides. Uh, so we can provide more information on the, on the 2050 maritime strategy if, if that's of use, but that's really where uh, 
the, the specific measures that we're taking are embedded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the answer. And the next question from the cadets from Makassar. Okay, please. Okay, thank you for the thanks that has given to me. My name is Muhammad Tarikayat. I'm from PP Makassar, or National Marine Polytechnic of Makassar, Nautical Department, a semester. In the development of transportation, the issue of revolution industry 4.0 is all operated by machine. Uh, and as the Indo Indonesian government trying to combine or integrate transportation between land, air, and sea. My question, what are the future of transportation system in UK? And it's a target, can we do the social service society and company in UK? Thank you. Thank, thank you for the questions. Uh, I hope the question is clear for you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, yes, it was, and it's, it's, it's an excellent question. And if, if previous questions deserved another lecture, that deserves a book. Um, I think the, the question of, of the future of transportation systems and the links to society. But let me try and answer briefly. I think um, you, you've hinted at the answer in, in the question, uh, because I think the answer is around integration. Uh, to be honest. I think that uh, if my successor as ambassador in 25 years is giving this lecture, I suspect he will have le less sex, he or she will have a less sexual approach. Uh, and I think we will be talking about transport as an integrated structure uh, in a way that perhaps we haven't done uh, today. And it will be a structure which is driven by big data, by automation, um, perhaps by artificial intelligence and other digital uh, innovations which we don't know yet. So I think that uh, that will have huge implications for society. So I think that the way in which transportation develops in the UK will matter to, uh, will matter to society. I think that the integration of systems which we're seeing in, in London, so not only transport modes, but also uh, payment systems and safety systems together, I think will be an increasing feature of transportation systems, which will allow people to have a more seamless experience of transport. So moving from modes of transport, moving between modes of transport much more, much more easily. And I think we will see increasingly uh, integration, as we already do, between transport systems and non-transport systems. So the example I gave from Cranfield University's uh, um, Centre of Excellence on how to integrate, you know, in, in that example, uh, baggage handling uh, with broader logistic systems, I think will be an increasing feature of, of what we see. And again, that will have real implications for, for society. Um, so sorry, that's a very general answer to, to an excellent question. But I, I think that by focusing on integration and by focusing on innovation, uh, we will be able to, uh, to work through a lot of the implications uh, for transportation in the UK as, as in Indonesia. I don't think these will be trends which are unique to to us in in london or the uk it will be it will be a global trend thanks thank you mr ambassador for the answer and uh, integration and the innovation is the answer for the future transportation okay uh the last uh, question for uh maritime session is from sorong My name is Sudriya Chiota. I'm from Soro Machine Marine Polytechnic. A successful and sustainable industry needs the right people with the right skill and rewarding care to attract new learners. In addition, it trend is extended to double in the next 20 years. Building human resources. Capacity in maritime what was shown before. I wonder how the UK government implemented the human resource development development program to meet the maritime sector. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, the cadets, for your questions about how the UK government implement the HRD strategy to meet the, the needs for the maritime sector sectors. Please, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Cadet, for your, for your question. Um, it's uh, another good one. So, I think the uh, you, know, you highlighted in your question the fact that maritime transport is expected to double um, in the next uh, in the next twenty years, and I think that realization has driven a lot of work in the UK as well. We we know that this sector is going to expand, uh, that we are going to need more human resource uh, to to deploy to it. Um, and that is partly why we have put so much emphasis on increasing the diversity of the system so that we are drawing on the biggest possible pool of talent um, to meet that greater need in, in the future. Uh, we've also recognised that in order to meet that, that greater need, we're going to need a, a more agile and again this word more innovate, innovative maritime um, system and that the hum, human resources needs uh, for that will need to be integrated now. So we've done a lot of work through the Maritime 2050 uh, system, uh, strategy, sorry, uh, to make sure that our human resources uh, development plans for today are factoring in those needs for, for the future. And again, uh, recognizing um, integration and innovation, again, as, as key to this, but also global integration, um, I think is particularly important for the maritime sector that, uh, uh, mariners are perhaps uniquely mobile um, and have been for, for hundreds of years. And I think the the idea of international standards and international skills development is particularly important here. English language being being part of that, uh, but the wider skill set also needing to meet uh, uh, the same standards, uh, whatever port one is in. And again, I think the UK has been lucky in that, in that we have the International Maritime Organization in, in London, and we have a very strong maritime uh, skills infrastructure already in place. So we've worked closely with our own polytechnics and with our own technical and vocational uh, institutions to make sure that that, that much bigger future, which you've, which you've described in your question, uh, is integrated into our skills development now. I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the answer for the all question from the cadets. And here with me at the mini studio, our mini studio is uh, uh, the head of Aviation Human Resources Development Centers, Mr. Harry Sudarmaji, and also Mr. Sahatua, the head of Maritime Human Resource Development Center. So maybe uh, please allow me to invite uh, them to give a question or comment about your presentations, maybe. Uh, okay, Ms. from Mr. Satwa first. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Owen. Uh, I think it has been a pleasure for all of the cadets and all of us here, especially uh, this event was uh, gratefully uh, facilitated by uh, our head of education, uh, head of uh, human resources, Development Agency, Mr. Sugiyarjo. Uh, I, I don't have any question. I think we have a very uh, a comprehensive presentation about the UK and what's going on in the transportation. And uh, we were very glad all the questions by the cadet was answered. And uh, we would really appreciate uh, that there are several uh, opportunities that has been raised and uh, mentioned by uh, Your Excellency, uh, uh, and we would be very much willing to uh, continue for the future collaboration, especially for us in the maritime uh, higher education. We have uh, uh, the mandatorily uh, education and training on board uh, the vessel, and uh, this. Uh, will be the mandatory requirement for the international uh, standard of STCW, whereas uh, implemented for the whole maritime education and training, as well as uh, in the UK. Uh, we would very much uh, be uh, 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 giving an opportunity in the future uh, with a more detailed discussion about the opportunity 
the opportunities not only to UK but uh, maybe in uh, UK and uh, several neighbors can neighboring countries uh, whereas we can uh, introduce our cadets uh, apprenticeships uh, uh, not only on board the ships uh, pro most probably also the opportunity to have an apprentice apprenticeships in the, the ports uh, area whereas we knew uh, in the UK also have a very uh, big uh, world-class uh, uh, ports like the London gateways, uh, etc. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, all from uh, me. And thank you very much again. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Sahatua. And the next, I, I kindly invite Mr. Harry. Thank you, Mr. Baharawi. I am Harry Sudarmaji, Head of Civil Aviation Human Resource Development Center. Mr. Owen Jenkin, we appreciate your presentation and transfer of knowledge for us, and it is very interesting. I have one question. If we want to make cooperation in human resource development or education, and training in aviation domain, such as developing curriculum, research and international publication, exchange lecturer, and also join for seminar, conference, and any related academic meeting. Please give us recommendation, what is the university in UK? Thank you. Thank you. Um, excellent question, and I'm, I'm very pleased that, uh, that that you focused on the opportunities uh, to take this forward. I, I certainly regard this lecture not as um, an end point, but as a starting point for, for our cooperation. Uh, so I've, I've talked about some of the uh, leading aviation um, uh, universities in uh, in my lecture, um, and we can send you through the details of them. Obviously, Cranfield is uh, is one of the ones which uh, works. Uh, very extensively on this. Um, I'm afraid I don't have in my head all of them and I don't want to be unfair, but perhaps we could follow up after the lecture with, um, with some information um, on the particularly strong uh, universities in the aviation area. Um, and then we can take forward collaboration in that way, if that's agreeable to you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And before I uh, pass, uh, uh, time to Mr. Sugiharjo for the final comment or final question. I have uh, one question about uh, the year program, uh, skill for prosperity programs. Is it only for maritime sectors or also for the other sectors? It's just the maritime sector at the moment. Uh, so it was particularly developed to bring together our, our two maritime uh, sectors. Uh, I think we'd be we'd be very happy to talk about what's possible in other areas, but that particular program is is just in the maritime sector. Okay, thank thank you, Mr. Ambassador. So uh, finally, I will ask uh, Mr. Sugiharjo to give a comment about uh, this uh, general lecture. Mr. Sugiharjo, please. Yeah, I thank you, to Excellency, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, very fruitful information and lecture to our cadets and I have uh, just I have one curiosity when you mentioned previously regarding center of excellence in UK uh, you didn't mention Leeds University for us in Indonesia especially for the land transportation Leeds University has a legacy. For in 1980, through the Leeds University, they developed the curriculum of higher education of land transportation, and also give the lecture for the beginning for maybe one or two years. And I give you the information that the alumni of the we call it STT Day which developed by the first one developed by Leeds University nowadays already at the top rank of the official in the Ministry of Transportation and also 
they continue for the master degree also in the Leeds. After they graduate from higher education in Indonesia, and they continue to the master degree in Leeds, and some of them are or already in the top level of official. Some, for example, of Iskandar already uh, retired, and now Pak Gede Pasek as Inspector General. He is also alumni from Leeds University, and many others in the second rank as a director, also alumni from Leeds University. That's why my curiosity, you didn't mention uh, Leeds University. And, and the second one, and I also uh, looking forward for the possibility to could be scholarship or Indonesia could send uh, by government expense to study for the master degree or international uh, doctoral degree in the UK. Maybe we can discuss later on about this uh, scholarship or also the how to go to school in for S master degree and doctoral degree. And maybe for some reason, sometime we can also uh, discuss regarding the, the exchange student or exchange the lecture between Indonesia and UK. I thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much indeed, Bhaktas uh, Piyajo. I think uh, excellent question. You're right. I didn't mention Leeds, and I probably should have done. It's it's still a very powerful uh, and expert university in uh, in the area of, of transportation. Um, and I should have remembered it's, it's my sister's university and my grandparents' university as well. So uh, I have a family link uh, which should have made me mention it. Uh, but you're right, it, is, it continues to be a very strong centre of excellence. Um, uh, I, I didn't have time to mention all of them, but, but Leeds is certainly there, and we'd be happy to continue that, that link if that's useful. Um, we'd also be very happy to talk about uh, what's possible in the area of um, master's education and, and, and so on. We, we ourselves run a, uh, a, a scholarship programme called the Chevening Scholarship Programme, which sponsors um, over 60 uh, Indonesians to go to the UK every year to, uh, to study master's programmes. And that can be in any sector. We're very, very happy to, to look at candidates um, in the transportation sector. Uh, but we'd also be happy to talk about the possibilities for a more focused cooperation in, in that area if that was, if that was of interest. Um, so I'm, again, I'm, I'm very glad that, that you, like me, see this as, um, as, as a process of engagement, not just a one-off lecture. I'm happy though I am to give that. I think there is huge potential collaboration in human resources development in the transportation sector between the UK and Indonesia. And I think the examples you've given about are exactly the sorts of things we'd, we'd be very happy to talk about uh, in more detail as we as we take it forward. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sugiharjo, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, the presentations of your uh, lecture uh, today. It's very enlightening us, uh, give us more information about how UK develop the transportation and also the people. As uh, the moderator, one, once again, I want to say thank you for your uh, present today in your uh, busy time. You spare your time to uh, share with us about your knowledge and experience. So as the moderator, I will not uh, make a conclusion or conclude your uh, lecture, but I want to emphasize your opening statement on your opening uh, uh, presentation that you said the development of infrastructure and technologies is important, but the skill development of the human resources is more important. I think that's all from me as the moderator. Thank you very much for all of you and have a good day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. And if I just might add my thanks to all of you, and in particular to the, uh, to the cadets um, all around Indonesia who've taken a lot of time to attend, attend this lecture. 
I'm sorry it's overrun, but I hope it has been of some use. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, His Excellency. Thank you, Mr. Bahrawi. Ladies and gentlemen, finally we've come to the end of this event. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, the Head of Human Resources Development Agency on Transportation would like to give a token of appreciation to the speakers, moderator, and participants for their support and success of this general lecture. As shown on the screen, the first certificate of appreciation is given to His Excellency Ambassador Owen Jenkins as our main speaker today. Thank you very much. We have also provided certificate of appreciation to Mr. Dunmont Gomery Hunt, political counselor and education attaché, Mrs. Mildred Pantau, education and skills advisor of British Embassy, Mr. Efrizal Saputra, trade and investment manager of British Embassy, Ms. Sabrina Fadila, trade and investment manager in British Embassy, and also for our moderator, Mr. Ahmad Bahrawi. Thank you. Now, to conclude today's event, I will invite everyone to turn on your camera to have a photo session. Kindly to turn on your camera on. To all participants. I kindly ask everyone to give the best smile. Ready? One, two, three. Once again, ready? One, two, three. Thank you so much. Finally, that's it for today's general lecture. Thank you so much for your time and kind attention. Terima kasih. Have a nice rest of the day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.